Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We ask now that you give us a laser focus on the most beautiful person who ever lived, on the most beautiful season of the year, and of the most beautiful God that is. And we pray that you give us a clear vision of him. Make everything else fade in comparison to the light that you are. Make your joy present. May your peace be poured out into us so that there is an unshakable faith in who you are and your reality, God. I pray that the words out of my mouth would would be the best gift you would re- we would receive this season. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's turn to our text this morning um, in Matthew chapter 1. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 1. When I was growing up, my my parents made it clear to us that we would not give gifts on Christmas. Because as my mother said, and now I repeat to my wife and child, it's Jesus' birthday, why are we getting gifts? So it's important that we understand that. I mean, it, it's a season of giving, of course, but I think in modern 2018, 21st century North American Christians, um, the consumerism of Christmas and the shopping that it, that involves perhaps is a bigger temptation to forget Jesus, is it not? And you can ask yourself that clearly. And so we don't give gifts at our, in our home. Now, when we are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, something we don't realize is We want to remember the birth of Jesus Christ the way that He wants us to remember it, right? We want to remember Him the way He intended us to remember Him. He didn't intend us to remember Him as a glorious baby, no. It was a baby in a manger. He didn't intend us to celebrate Him as a great, powerful king born. No, He was a weak, crying baby that needed diaper changing. And that causes the Muslims to stumble. The fact that he needed diapers, it does. It really does. So what does it mean to remember Jesus the way he intended us to remember him? Well, that's from the scriptures. The scriptures gives you a blueprint of the way we should celebrate Christmas. Yesterday, Alice asked me what I was going to preach about, and I said, Matthew. And she said, oh, the story of Jesus. I said, no, Matthew chapter 1, the genealogy. Because that's the way God intended us to remember him. So we're going to read the genealogy, and it's going to be amazing. We're going to love this genealogy, just like we all love genealogies, okay? So let's read it in one voice. And if you don't know how to pronounce those names, it's okay. Just read it by faith, okay? Let's read it together. One, two, three. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Abinadab, and Abinadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, 
and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shentiel, and Sheltiel was the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel was the father of Abiud, and Abiud was the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim was the father of Azor, and Azor was the father of Zadok, Zadok was the father of Achim, and Achim was the father of Eliud, and Eliud the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Matan, and Matan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. Amen. You're sighing because you realize that that was just a whole bunch of gibberish to us 21st century people. In fact, most of us, as we were reading it, your response maybe was like my wife's response yesterday when we were reading it for our family devotions. She said, you're preaching on this? I, why don't we get to the real meat of the gospel message, which is the stories? But that's not the way God intended his son to be remembered. His son was to be remembered by this genealogy. Now, why would God begin the story of the most important person in all history with this dry, seemingly irrelevant genealogy? For most people, when we read that and when we read the Bible, if you're doing your devotions, you're doing your whole finish the Bible in one year plan and you're reading through genealogies like numbers, you can't wait till that's over. You're just like, I don't even know how you we, we go through it. It's not just you. It's the seminary students as well. So when I went into seminary, they made sure that the entrance exam, they tested the genealogies to say who was the father of this guy. And if you didn't get that question, you failed. And I, I did fail the first entrance exam. I didn't memorize the genealogies. Who would? But God intends for genealogies to teach something that modern 21st century people could never really understand. You see, I'm just going to preach over that buzz and see if it goes away. The For the modern 21st century people, genealogies don't mean anything because we as a culture, especially in the West, all we care about is what you do and where you were educated. We call that the CV, your curriculum vitae. What you do and where you were educated is where we see your credentials, where we give you your credit. Thank you. And someone's credentials matter a lot. That's how you go and get a job. You give them your CV first, and then they look at it, they approve it, and then there's the interview. But in the first century, and in most parts of the world actually, the world does not operate based on what you do and where you were educated. They frankly wouldn't care less. They couldn't care less about what you do and where you were educated. They care more about what family you come from. Because as most cultures believe, your family determines your character. You can fake things on CVs. You can put in your strengths and avoid the weaknesses. You can put in the jobs that you did where you did really well and performed well and you leave out the jobs where you mouthed off at the boss and you angered your coworkers and you left that job in a huff. You leave that one out because in, in case they call it and that job gives you a bad reputation, you leave that out. So your curriculum vitae, your CV can easily be fudged as it were but not your family. They look at your family, they look at your father, your mother, they look at your brothers, your uncles, your aunts, they look at your grandparents, and they know if this family operates in a certain way, has a certain culture about it, 
they will shape this person in ways he might not even be able to change. We Chinese know this. We have a famous saying. We say, San sui kan basu. You say, a person, you look at them at three years old and you can determine how they are when they, when they are 80. Well, what happens in between that? The family shapes the character. And so for the Jewish people, just as for many parts of the world and many parts of the world where we come from, it matters more where you come from. And so genealogies really, really matter. They call it the pedigree. If you've been paying attention to the famous cu a couple of the new popular New York Times bestsellers on the, on the market right now, there's a famous book right now out called Crazy Rich Asians or The Problems of the Rich. Now, those books are really interesting for Western people because they give an insight for white people and black people on how Chinese people operate and how Asians operate. And you see in those books this huge emphasis on where you come from. Where you come from determines where you will go and how much people respect you or despise you. And so right at the beginning of the genealogy of the Gospel of Matthew, of the story of Jesus, Matthew wants to make it clear. He wants to put Jesus' CV right in front of everyone. He wants to put Jesus' genealogy all the way up to Abraham, and he wants to make it clear what kind of family Jesus came out of. And the fact is that when Jesus, when Matthew puts out this genealogy, he is actually making it clear to every person, every Middle Eastern person who read this, he is making it absolutely clear to those readers that Jesus did not come out of a good family. He came out of a terrible family. Not only were his immediately father and mother poor people, though they were of the descendant of the royal blood of David, by that time the blood of David and the royal line of David meant absolutely nothing. The, the kingdom was over. They were under the Roman rule. The nation is in ruins. They had just come out of 400 years of exile. Where's the glory in that? But what really, really marks me and will mark you, I hope, by the end of today is what Matthew does in this genealogy. I, I said that in our CVs, you would never, ever list out in detail your failures, right? You would never do that. I mean, it, you, if you did that, your bosses would not hire you. If you made it clear that one time you you screamed and swore and flipped tables at this office because of some slight that someone said to you and you lost your temper, or maybe if you write that you're often late and you often miss your deadlines and you're not really good at communicating with your coworkers, you would never put those things. Nor would you put things that are shameful and secrets in your life. You would never say that you cheated on your wife in your CVs. You would never write that you have an addiction to pornography on your CVs. You would never share these things because they make you look bad and they make you make people despise you. But Matthew does exactly that. He doesn't magnify the glorious moments of the family line of Jesus. He magnifies their sins. He magnifies their shame. And he magnifies the most secret, dark parts of their life and he puts it out and he highlights it in such a way nobody can miss this. No first century reader reading this would miss this. They would see it and they would, I'm sure they would be sweating for this, for this genealogy. Don't you want people to love Jesus? Don't you want people to respect Jesus? Why would you take out their dirty laundry? Why would you take out the darkness of our of their family history and put it up there for everyone to see? What in the world are you doing, Matthew? Talk about bad advertisement. 
Now, what do I mean here? And I want to point you to four people in this story. That's why I gave the title this morning called Out of the Sins of the Fathers. I'm going to point you to four people. And after I show you these four people, I'm going to talk about why Jesus, he commanded Matthew to write this. So the first person that is highlighted here, they come out as like a sore, it's like they stick out like a sore sore thumb here. There are four names here, four individuals that pop out. The first one is this woman named Tamar in verse 3. It says, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. The second is this another woman called Rahab in verse 5. And Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. The next is another woman. And Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth. The fourth woman comes in verse 6. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. These four names of women would have, for the first century readers, stood out so unusually because very, very, very seldom do you put a woman's name in a genealogy. They always kept the family line through the fathers. You can go through all of the numbers, the genealogies and numbers, and you will find that you seldom find the name. Sometimes there is a name that pops up, and that's for a very specific reason. So why here, at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, when he's presenting Jesus, does he point to these four people? And I'm going to tell you, and I'm trying to explain to you, that these four people are a magnification of the sins of the fathers. That's what he's doing. Tamar. Who is Tamar? Tamar had a, two sons, Perez and Sarah, Zerah, from Judah. But Judah was the father-in-law of Tamar. You can read this story in Genesis 38. I won't go through the details of it. But the heart of the story and the most disturbing part of the story was that because Tamar was not able to have a son from his husband and his second husband, she dressed up as a prostitute, a shrine prostitute, and stood outside of a, at the, and a crossroad. And when Judah her father-in-law passed by. He asked for her services, not knowing that he, she was his daughter-in-law, and he slept with her. She became pregnant. They found out. They wanted to kill her and burn her alive because she had just committed adultery. And then Tamar revealed to Judah that she was that cult shrine prostitute. And so he rescinds, and he doesn't kill her, his father-in-law. But what happens is, right there at the very beginning of Jesus' genealogy, there is this disturbing, and you can even say a disgusting, case of incest. The Jewish law in the Torah made it clear that if any woman were to sleep with her father or mother, They should be stoned. This was an absolute scandal. And we don't read about Judah turning around. We don't really read about Tamar repenting. We don't read of that. All we read of in chapter 38 of Genesis is the sin. And here, Matthew is reminding everybody about that. The second person, Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute in Jericho. She had helped two spies that came to survey the land before they were going to completely destroy Jericho. And she helped these two spies, and the two spies promised that when they returned to destroy the city, 
they would spare her and anybody that were in her house. And so the story you read in Joshua chapter, uh, you read about her in chapter 6, you find that she ends up joining the family of God, the Israelites, and she lives with them. But here you find that she marries a Jewish man. Salmon, which means Solomon, really, or peace. She marries a Jewish man, a prostitute Canaanite woman, a Gentile woman, who would have been unclean and unable to come and worship in the temple. She marries a Jewish man, and she gives birth to Boaz. Now, Boaz, you know of from the book of Ruth, and here, Ruth is pointed out because Ruth was a Gentile woman as well. She was a Moabite woman. In fact, all four of these women are likely Gentile women. Okay? But it's clear that Ruth was one. She was a Moabite. Her husband, her father-in-law, her mother-in-law had sinfully allowed for their son to marry a Moabite. It was clear in the law that they should not marry non-Jews, just like Christians are called to not marry non-Christians. And they disobeyed God. They disobeyed that commandment. They went away from their own people and they married a Moabite woman. And this woman was Ruth. And here Matthew makes it clear that Jesus came out of such family. Now the fourth name is perhaps the most striking one. Because it seems as though in the genealogy you have all these names and all these scandals and finally get to King David. And everyone, when they see King David, everyone's heart just, they, they, they rejoice because we all love David. Everyone loves David. That's why his statue is in the, the Palais Louvre in, uh, in, 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 in Paris. Michelangelo carved out this beautiful statue of him out of marble. We love King David. We read his Psalms. Two-thirds of them are written by David. We love his, his Psalms. We think he's a, a great man because God thinks he's a good man, calling him a man after God's own heart. But here, Matthew is doing something else. He wants every reader to get to the point of David. And then he says something about David that points not to his faith, not to his great repentance even. He points like a laser directly at the most scandalous thing that I think ever happened in all of Israel, his, Israel's history. King David here, it says in verse 6, was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Now why didn't he say King David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba? We know her name. Why doesn't she just Bathsheba? Because Matthew wants to make it absolutely clear that he raped the woman and murdered her husband, Uriah. He wanted to make it absolutely clear that King David took this poor man's wife, forced her to sleep with him, gave, have, have made her pregnant and tried to cover up that sin by sending Uriah all the way to the front of the line of battle and then retreating, leaving him to die in the field. And it took a desperate and a clear rebuke by prophet Nathan for David to turn around. Every Jewish little boy knew of the story. You read about it in the book of Samuel, in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. And everybody would have tried to cover this up. If you're going to present the Messiah, not just to your own people, but to the whole world, you would never have pointed to this case of rape, murder, and political scandal. But Matthew doesn't do that. He puts a magnifying glass to these four people so that we can see their sins full on. Now, why does he do this? Why does he do this? There are two reasons I think that are clear here. 
The first is because right after chapter 1, you read in chapter 1, verse 18 to 25, another scandal brewing. You read about Joseph discovering his wife pregnant. He's devastated. The families had gotten together. The families had planned for this amazing wedding. They had arranged it. They had pledged for their daughter to be given to to Joseph, who was a righteous and a good man. They had given the dowry. They had given the, the gifts that brides were to receive and grooms were to give. And then at this point, Joseph discovers that his wife, is, his, his, his fiancée is pregnant. He discovers that she's perhaps been adulterous. And, and she know, he knows that she's going to be stoned. She's going to be killed. The whole village will take stones and throw them at her because she has committed adultery. And it took an angel to appear to him to remind him that God has always worked in ways beyond our imagination. To tell him, don't fear. Go and take Mary as your wife. You see, when when Joseph took Mary to be his wife, he didn't just take a pregnant woman to be his wife. He took a scandal. And he entered into that scandal. And every person in that village would have seen Joseph, would have known about Mary, and they would have despised him. His reputation is out the window. His blamelessness in front of the people is out the window. They see him and her now as immoral people. And this immoral label will follow Jesus and Mary and Joseph all the way until the cross. And the question is, God, why do you do things like this? Why don't you make things more glorious? Why don't you do things in ways that are more easy for people to understand and accept. If you put a genealogy out like this, no one will want your Jesus. No one will want your son. Now, why do you do this? And with the few minutes that I have left, I I just want to point you to a few things that I think God is doing here. I think God is trying to say to you and to me through these four individuals, He is saying, that I will not only come into the world, I will come into your sin. I won't just come into the world to take you out of the sin, I will become that sin. And no sin, no scandal, no weakness or darkness, no addiction, no betrayal, no adultery can hinder my plan. I will do it, and you cannot stop it. I will take your strengths and work it for my will, and I will also take your weaknesses and work it for my will. I will take your willingness and your obedience and work it for my kingdom, and I will take your sin and your disobedience and I will work it for my will. I don't need your strength. I don't need your righteousness. I don't even need your willingness. I don't even need your obedience. I will take these broken people in this terrible family, and I will bring out my son for the salvation of the world, and for the joy of his people. That's what he wants to say. That God has always, and will always, 
He will magnify His grace in the brokenness of His people. Never in the strength. Never. He doesn't need you to be strong. That would deter people from His glory. That would distract people from His glory. He has always and will always laser in and focus in on the weakest place of your life and say, why don't you give me that? Because I'm going to take that I'm going to put it on a pedestal and I will show people how weak you are and then I'm going to show people how powerful I am. That's why Paul can say these crazy things like boasting in weakness. I mean, He's he's spreading the gospel for goodness sakes. He's trying to bring people to Jesus. And he is boasting in his weakness. But he understands this. He's understood the Christmas message. That it is out of the sins of our fathers that he will bring forth his salvation. I think that if we really understood this, if we really understood what it means for Jesus to take our sins and to use it for His glory and to take our weakness and to use it for His glory, if we really understood this, we wouldn't be so afraid in life. We also wouldn't be so guilt-ridden. Because a focus on your weakness and a focus on your guilt is a clear indication that you have not understood the Christmas story. That He has always worked out of your weakness. Never, and I mean it, never out of your strength. 2 Corinthians 12 said this. It says, God is speaking to Paul and says, My grace will be sufficient for you for... so." My grace will be sufficient for you for or because because out of your weakness will my power be made perfect. Not out of your strength. Not out of your wisdom. Not out of your successes. The world has successes. God doesn't need that. It is out of your weakness that His power is made perfect. Do you remember that time when the brothers of Joseph had come to Joseph in Egypt and they were terrified that he was going to have revenge on him? And Joseph looks directly at his brothers and he says, you meant things for evil. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. You meant to harm me and to kill me, and to sell me into Egypt, but God meant it for something you never would have imagined. That's how great God is. You meant to sin. You meant to lie. You meant to walk away from Jesus. You meant it. It was sinful. But God will mean it for His good and for your good. Your addictions, you mean it for evil but God means it for good. Your sins that you speak to your husbands or wives and the things that you commit to your friends and family and colleagues, that selfishness and greed, you mean it for evil. But God means it for good. That's how great Jesus is. He doesn't even need your obedience to glorify Himself and to give you, finally, salvation. We believe here at Grace Church and that's what we mean by the sovereignty of God. He creates the faith in you. He doesn't expect it out of you. He creates it. Tamar had no faith. Rahab in the beginning had no faith. Perhaps for all we know she was doing it to spare herself. Bathsheba had no faith. All these people were God's purposeful 
part of God's purposeful plan to accomplish a perfect work out of completely broken people. And if you understand this, you will not be afraid. And you will not be angry. And you will not lose your faith. I think this Christmas season, the most important thing for us to receive, of course, is Jesus Christ. But what can you offer Him? It's His birthday, after all. What can you offer Him? I think the best thing you can offer Jesus this day and tomorrow and, and, and Tuesday is to say to Jesus, Here I am, broken and all, sinful and unrepentant, unwilling to follow, unwilling to obey. Here I am. This is what I offer to you. And God will just take that life of yours with all the brokenness and all the weakness and all that sin, and He will take it. And out of that weakness and sin and brokenness, He will make His power perfect. That's the gift He asks for. The question is, will you give it to Him? You see, the sinful heart and the unbelieving heart is so twisted that even in our desperate weakness, we will not give weakness to God. Even in our desperate sin, we know we cannot come out of that addiction. We will not offer it to Jesus. But I pray it not be so. I pray that this season, you will offer to Jesus the only thing He's ever asked for. Your sins. Your sorrows. And your brokenness. I'm going to read to you the lyrics from a song. This is my gift to you. Okay. We're not going to sing a hymn close. I'm just going to read this for you. Okay. The first four lines are found on page 31 of your hymn books if you want to follow along. Maybe that would be a good idea. Page, it's hymn 31 in your hymn books. I'm just going to read the first four lyrics from here. And then there's one that's not written there, and I'm going to read it from my, from my cell phone here. So this poem that was later written into a song is called God Moves in a Mysterious Way. God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessings on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for His grace, behind a frowning providence, He hides a smiling face. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan His work in vain. But God is His own interpreter and He will make it plain. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Let's pray. King Jesus, we love you with all of our soul, our heart, our mind, and our strength. And we love you because you enable us to. And thank you, Jesus. Thank you for giving us your life. Today, I, I want to give you all of my sins. 
all of my weaknesses, all the failures of my past, I will boast of them. I give them to you for this Christmas and receive in exchange your righteousness, your power, your forgiveness, your peace. Our hearts overwhelm with joy. Thank you, Jesus. We pray all these things in your precious, precious name. Amen.